In July 1967, the Soviet Union reveals what appears to be a new super fighter, and it sets off alarm bells. At the time, the U.S. had no fighter in their operational inventory that could constantly, if successfully, combat the Foxbat. It was believed to have multiple air-to-air -air and long-range air-to-surface missile capabilities, all at a speed of Mach 3. With the United States and Soviet Union locked in a struggle for air superiority, the Soviets seemed to be winning. Faced with the prospect of being outclassed in the skies, the United States would respond by engineering the greatest fighter jet in history. In the Korean War, early fighter jets like the American F-86 and Soviet MiG-15 squared off in fierce air-to-air -air battles. Both were light, agile jets built for close-range dogfighting. But by the mid-1950s, new technologies were beginning to radically transform fighter aircraft design. Powerful new radars could detect the enemy from much greater distances, while newly introduced guided missiles could hit targets miles away. Military planners grew convinced that air battles of the future would be fought beyond visual range, where the enemy wouldn't be more than a distant blip on a radar screen. And it meant the newest fighter jet, the F-4 Phantom, was no longer light or agile. It was fast, heavily loaded with missiles, and carried a powerful radar. Many believed that dogfighting had become obsolete, but in reality, nothing could be further from the truth. In the Vietnam War, the Air Force's new approach was put to the test. Things didn't go as planned. The skies over Vietnam were a chaotic mix of enemy and friendly aircraft, and the systems designed to help Air Force pilots identify the enemy proved unreliable forcing pilots to get in close to visually confirm each target. The whole idea of engaging from a distance fell apart. The new F-4 Phantoms were pulled into close-quarter dogfights against more agile MiGs, something their pilots had never been trained to do. And the Phantoms' guided missiles proved hopelessly inaccurate. Designed for larger, high-altitude targets, only 14% ever hit anything. When the missiles failed, pilots were defenseless, because the F-4 was built without a gun for close combat. The larger, less maneuverable Phantoms with their notoriously smoky engines were easily spotted. The more agile MiGs lured the F-4s in close, knowing they were vulnerable. The F-4 just barely held its own in this airspace because it is an interceptor used as a fighter, finding it difficult to compete with a fighter designed as a fighter. American pilots were being downed at alarming rates, and military planners were learning that the age of dogfighting was far from over. Air Force planners scrambled to respond, equipping the F-4 with pod-mounted Gatling guns and training pilots to engage the more maneuverable MiGs, but these were stopgap solutions. What the Air Force really needed was a new dedicated air superiority fighter, and it meant scrapping every one of its earlier concepts for the next generation of fighter aircraft, which now looked too large, too heavy, and likely to fare even worse than the Phantom, and they'd have to move quickly. Because in 1967, the Soviet Union unveiled a new fighter of their own, and it looked nothing like the MiGs that the F-4 Phantoms were squaring off with in Vietnam. Everything seemed to suggest a fighter built for extreme maneuverability, with twin tails, a massive wingspan, and monstrous engines. Intelligence experts suspected the Soviets were using advanced lightweight materials, along with new radar and weapon systems. A few months later, the Soviets went on a record-setting spree, posting new world speed and altitude records with the new fighter. If the experience in Vietnam wasn't concerning enough, the Soviet Union now looked ready to unleash a new superfighter. After spending the better part of two decades building mostly interceptors, fighter bombers, and attack aircraft, the Air Force finally set its sights on building a state-of-the-art air superiority fighter. In 1968, leading U.S. aircraft designers were invited to submit proposals. Their entries would be assessed using a groundbreaking concept called energy maneuverability, a mathematical formula to help define a fighter's total performance in terms of speed, thrust, drag, and weight. In December 1969, the contract to build the new fighter was awarded to McDonnell Douglas. Their design was the product of 2.5 million man-hours of effort, allowing development to begin immediately. The F-15 Eagle was designed from the ground up for tactical dominance in any airspace. Two afterburning turbofans could unleash a massive 48,000 pounds of combined thrust, enough power to break the sound barrier, 
even while flying straight up. With a top speed of over Mach 2.5, the F-15 would be the fastest fighter jet ever produced by the United States. For peak performance, the engines were fitted with variable air intakes with a computerized air inlet control system adjusting to ensure optimal airflow at any speed or angle of attack. Where earlier fighters like the F-4 had a reduced wing area for high supersonic speeds, in the F-15, engineers instead opted for low wing loading which combined with a high thrust to weight ratio delivered superior maneuverability. For maximum situational awareness, the cockpit was mounted high in the fuselage with a canopy offering a commanding 360 degree view along with a digital heads up display fully integrating with radar and avionics. Eight Sparrow and Sidewinder missiles were mounted under wings and along the fuselage. But if things got up close and personal, a 20mm Gatling gun could dish out up to 6,000 rounds a minute. And for maximum survivability, engineers designed in triple redundant hydraulics, low vulnerability flight controls, and a reinforced airframe. With its combination of speed, power, and agility, the F-15 was ready to earn its place as one of the greatest fighters ever built. The first prototype was unveiled in June 1972, just three years after McDonnell Douglas was given the go-ahead. The new fighter was put through an extensive testing program, and it would have to prove itself against the best of what the Air Force had to offer. Up against the heavy F-4 Phantom, the F-15 looked assured and in control, easily making quick work of the interceptor. Even the smaller F-5, used to simulate more agile MiG fighters in combat, struggled to shake the larger F-15. In nearly every engagement, whether beyond visual range or close-in dogfighting, the F-15 commanded an overwhelming advantage. With a true air superiority fighter on their hands, the Air Force was ready to send a message to the Soviet Union. Only a year and a half earlier, the Soviets posted new Time to Climb World Records with the MiG-25. Now the F-15 was about to erase them. In 1975, engineers stripped a pre-production F-15 of its non-mission critical components, even removing its paint to make it as light as possible. In the cold, dense air of North Dakota, the Eagle made a series of climbs from a dead stop, rocketing up to altitudes as high as 30 kilometers. Right to the edge of the Earth's stratosphere, not only did the F-15 beat the MiG's records, it shattered them by more than 25%. The Air Force had a winner on their hands, and the F-15 Eagle would come to be recognized as one of the most successful fighter development programs in history. By 1974, the fighter was already in mass production, with over 400 early F-15A and B models ordered for the U.S. Air Force. And America's allies were also eager to get their hands on the new jet. The first foreign operator was Israel, beginning in 1976, followed by Japan a couple years later and Saudi Arabia. And, with some of the first F-15s being deployed at West German air bases right on the Soviet Union's doorstep, it seemed only a matter of time before the new fighter faced off against the MiG-25. In 1976, the Americans finally got their first-hand look at the Soviet Union's super fighter. But it wasn't what they were expecting. In September of that year, Lt. Viktor Belenko, a 29-year-old pilot with Soviet Air Defense Forces, made a fateful decision to escape the Soviet Union. And he did it by secretly flying his MiG-25 from a Soviet airbase in the Far East to a civilian airport in Japan. After more than a decade shrouded in mystery, the Americans got a chance to examine the Foxbat down to every last detail. Although similar in size and appearance, the MiG-25 and F-15 had almost nothing else in common. Built mostly out of heavy nickel steel alloy, the Foxbat weighed nearly twice as much as the F-15. The large wings weren't for agility, they were needed just to get the monstrous jet airborne. The enormous weight meant that the MiG-25 could only pull a 4.5G maneuver. The F-15 was capable of nearly twice that. Most of what the MiG carried was the fuel needed to feed its enormous engines. Even so, its combat radius was a mere 300 kilometers. Its avionics used outdated vacuum tubes, and its radar lacked look-down capability, meaning it couldn't even detect a F-15 flying below its horizon. The MiG-25 was anything but the dogfighting monster the Americans had feared. It was purely a high-altitude interceptor, 
designed to reach incredible speeds to catch enemy bombers, but it wasn't built to do much else. The Soviets had kept the Foxbats' capabilities a closely guarded secret, cashing in on its propaganda value and the alarm it had caused the Americans, but now it was the Soviets' turn to panic. Because in 1976, the Soviet Union had no fighter that stood any chance of surviving a dogfight with an F-15. F-15 scored their first victories in 1979 when Israeli pilots downed four Syrian MiG-21s in a single engagement. Over the years, the Eagle would win air battle after air battle, clearing the skies of adversaries almost as a matter of routine. Now, we know that F-15C and D were both incredibly lethal in air-to-air -air combat during Operation Desert Storm but it was the F-15 Strike Eagle's first and only air-to-air -air kill during Desert Storm that would become the most memorable. Picture this. Valentine's Day, 1991. The offensive part of the first Gulf War was in full swing. U.S. Air Force Captains Richard Bennett and Dan Backey, pilot and weapons system officer, were on a Scud patrol. AWACS had ordered their F-15E to hit some hind gunships that were close to Special Forces operation. According to Backy, their radar got spotty when they moved in to strike. They couldn't get a proper missile lock, because one of the Hinds began to accelerate so fast. Backy switched his thinking to a ground attack. Backy could see the Hinds' rotors using his lantern pod ground targeting system, so what did he do? He sent a laser-guided, 2,000-pound GBU-10 bomb onto the chopper as it began to lift off. The bomb went through the rotors and cockpit, and the munition exploded underneath the hind, completely disintegrating the helicopter. After the stunning display of destruction, the other Iraqi helicopters in the area bolted with their tail rotors between their legs. More U.S. air cover came in to protect the ground force, and after the Special Forces team was extracted, they confirmed the F-15E's kill, cementing the tail as a very noteworthy way to down a helicopter. Another very remarkable feat achieved by the F-15 is quite literally out of this world. In 1985, the U.S. military has been locked into a cold war with the Soviet Union for nearly 40 years. Russia versus the U.S., spy versus spy. Each determined to gain control of the ultimate high ground, space. The Soviets would put up satellites frequently, take pictures, and very, very accurately keep up with the United States military forces. They could very quickly launch satellites in a matter of hours, and launch a lot of them. The Pentagon saw the satellites as a dangerous threat to national security. A radical idea was created. In theory, the F-15 made the most sense. It was powerful enough that it could carry a 3,000-pound rocket, and it could carry it to the altitudes and at the velocities that would allow the rocket to be launched into space. It sounds like science fiction, but it was a very real plan with very high stakes. The satellite chosen for destruction was an out-of-date American research satellite called the P-78-1. The man chosen to destroy it, Major General Pearson. At 12.40 in the afternoon, September 13, 1985, Pearson straps into his F-15. There's a 3,000-pound, 18-foot-long missile mounted to the jet's centerline. The satellite is 345,000 feet above the Earth. It's moving at 23,000 feet per second, and once his F-15 reaches 30,000 feet, Pearson has just a 10-second window to fire the missile. If his timing was off, he'd miss it completely. Rocketing into the air, Pearson pulls the F-15 into a steep climb. At 35,000 feet, he fires. An infrared honing device on the rocket guides it as it heads into the sky, and boom. The F-15 has done what no other plane has ever been able to accomplish. Shooting down the satellite sends a rather strong message to the Soviets. Today, the F-15s have racked up more than 100 victories without a single defeat, a record unmatched by any fighter in history. Early F-15A and B models were joined by the C and D variants, improving on the aircraft's range, payload, and weapon systems. Originally conceived of as an air superiority fighter, the F-15 would also be developed into a formidable ground attack aircraft, leveraging the fighter's superior range, speed, and payload. Nearly a half century after taking to the skies, the F-15 remains vital to the U.S. Air Force, with deliveries beginning in 2021 
of the F-15EX, a thoroughly modernized replacement for the F-15C. What, what do you think of the F-15? Is it really the greatest fighter jet ever built? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe while you're down there. If you feel like it, you can check out some of my other content above, and if not, I hope to see you in the next one.